Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. My goodness, Computex 2021 was really cool. There were a couple of very obvious announcements from NVIDIA, which we'll get to later on in the video, but a ton of cool stuff announced by AMD, and perhaps one of the most important, and this is not a very technical measurement, but coolest things that I've seen in quite some time, and that is a Ryzen processor featuring uh, 3D V cache technology. So what exactly is that? Well, I'm sure most of us at this point are familiar with the basics of, let's say, a 5950X or a 5900X. Obviously, we have multiple CCDs which can come together to form a larger processor. So for example, if we're talking about the 5950X, we have two CCDs. Each of these CCDs has eight cores, 16 threads, with its own 32 megabytes of L3 cache. So this, of course, means that you have an awful lot of uh, cache on the processor and a ton of cores. But hypothetically speaking, what if you add a lot more cache? Well, good news for you, because it doesn't have to be hypothetical, because AMD have done just that. I'll get into how it works in just a moment, but first of all, let's look at a benchmark, because I think that benchmarks perhaps best illustrate anything. Gears 5 was shown off by AMD on a 5900X, and basically what they did is they locked the cores to 4 gigahertz. I'm interested why they chose 4 gigahertz specifically rather than a slightly higher clock frequency, but it is what it is. And well, you can see on screen the performance difference yourself roughly about 12% to 15%, depending on the game. They showed a few different results uh, towards the end of the benchmark. Now, that is very impressive. That is actually kind of a generational leap in performance. That's like what you would expect from going, let's say, from Zen 2 to Zen 3, or presumably Zen 3 to Zen 4, in terms of IPC anyway. It is significant. But this slide, AMD's 3D chiplet technology, perhaps illustrates how this works in a very succinct manner. So you can see yourself the actual, you know, CCD, which is pretty similar to how you would normally have a CCD. The difference is that we have 64 megabytes of L3 cache, which is plonked next to the CCD. And then this is connected using silicon wires, or rather through silicon wires, excuse me. But what's really important about this is the method that they've actually used to connect this. They've used direct copper to copper bonds, and this basically vastly reduces the energy requirements for communication. And that might sound like a very small detail, but when you're really talking about a chip this size, reducing power consumption, reducing heat output, these things are not minute details. They sound like they could easily be kind of lost in the cliff notes, but believe me, this would be a really big deal. And I would be very curious to see a simulation of like a kind of more traditional bonding method versus this. And obviously we're never going to see that, but I'd be very interested to see if AMD did any internal testing on that just for my own nya factor. And yes, nya factor is a technical term again. But either way, we have this communication method, again, uh, via the TSVs, um, which is offering a two terabyte per second connection between the Zen's CCD and the memory. And Lisa then held a, um, a chip which only had one of these um, 3DV caches, which is on the left side. You can see like an additional chip. Um, and then, of course, the traditional 5950X or 5900X CCD, which you can see on the right. Now, according to Lisa, when it's packaged up, it's basically identical because clearly here we have the heat spreader, which has been removed. So that's why it looks a little bit different compared to, let's say, your home 5900X. But if you were to take off the, you know, the, the heat spreader, the IHS, then it would look basically like this inside. And this is created on a 7NM process. Now, this is a prototype, and whether we're going to see this released to the market, I honestly have no idea. AMD have stated that this is definitely going to be a product that we see a lot more of in the future. And quite honestly, I have a ton more to say about this product, but as of the time I'm recording this, 
there is still kind of things that are being, let's say, found out about it. So I'm, I'm ultra excited about this technology. I mean, honestly, my brain is everywhere just kind of thinking how this could work on a grander scale. Just imagine, you know, you could have a situation where, because each of these CCDs is essentially getting an extra 64 megabytes of cache, right? So just imagine how this would scale up to, let's say, data center, which has, let's say, 64 cores. But furthermore, and again, this is not a small detail, the software itself is not optimized even. This is just kind of like you're just plonking it in. To use Jensen's words, it just works. Now, I can't help but wonder the impact if this was optimized for a data center environment or even games in the future. I don't know how big of a deal uh, it would be for games in terms of optimization. Um, because obviously it would be a smaller subset of developers that were probably willing to do it. I don't know about that, but, you know, th those kind of d details don't really, you know, kind of fit what I'm trying to say here. The, the TLDR in the data center, this could be extremely interesting, because even though we're increasing the amount of available bandwidth by moving to DDR5, um, which of course is also going to be a thing for the 600 series boards too, again, having tons of fast um, memory really close to the chip so you're reducing latency you've got super fast communication it, it, it's just it's super exciting and I think this stuff could be a precursor to a lot of really cool ideas um, imagine for example this type of technology but with an APU uh, for laptops so for example we could have let's say a similar amount of cash but then Instead, this is also for an APU, which maybe just the GPU can get a portion of it. I don't know um, exactly how AMD will be using this over the next uh, several years. But one thing's for certain, there's a lot of cool stuff on the horizon. You know what? I'm going to leave that right where it is for now because we've got a lot more to talk about. And quite frankly, I'm probably going to do a video on 3D stacking in the not too distant future. But... Anyway, let's move on to AMD's FSR technology. I kind of leaked some of this yesterday, um, but I just want to quickly go over it again because uh, AMD have provided a bit more detail. I didn't want to give away all of the details of their conference uh, in my video yesterday. I didn't really feel that that was fair to AMD, so I kind of left some stuff out. But um, yeah, so AMD, again, they actually have uh, made public the slide that I mentioned I had access to along with a couple of other slides. Uh, perhaps the most interesting thing here is the fact that, again, you can see yourself the numbers that I reeled off yesterday, 150 for performance, and then, of course, native is 49 FPS, which is a three times increase. But other resolution, or sorry, rather, other quality settings obviously have different performance metrics. And it's also worth noting that this does work on a GTX 1060. So AMD showed off Godfall running um, at the 1440p Epic preset. And uh, basically it went from 27 FPS up to 38 FPS. And this is utilizing the quality mode. Uh, so obviously quality mode um, here, it's roughly doubling the frame rates on the, um, on the 6800 XT. And providing that my math isn't complete and utterly crap, it doesn't seem to give you so much of a performance jump. It's only a 41% jump here. So maybe this is why AMD is stating that it's only a two times increase on average. I don't know. They also mentioned that it does work on older cards, which is again, something I leaked previously. They mentioned it works on 500 series Polaris cards, but Unless I had uh, a stroke or something like that, it seemed like it didn't mention the 400 series, which is curious given they're the same architecturally, albeit with some modest changes in terms of, let's say, clock frequency. Regardless, this looks very darn cool. Now, I'm hearing some comments regarding the visual quality. However, it's worth noting that, first of all, this is not final, and we haven't really seen enough implementations of this yet. It's only shown in Godfall, um, second of all, it does depend on the quality mode. And thirdly, this is AMD's kind of first attempt. Personally speaking, I don't play any really fast action games anymore, like I used to, but I don't really do it anymore. So I would probably, if it were me, um, and I have a 6800 XT, 
I would probably play games at like ultra quality where I could just kind of nudge a little bit of extra performance, but that's just me. Maybe for a faster paced action game, I'd maybe consider quality. But of course, as always, this is down to you. Um, AMD have also stated, of course, that it's going to be on the GPU, uh, sorry, it's going to be on GPU open, so it's naturally down to you as a developer to kind of implement it into your thing. Again, it was commented that uh, currently we have 10 different studios which are going to be leveraging it, and it's going to work over 100 different GPUs and CPUs, four different quality settings, and again, up to four times faster than the native, and it's going to become available the 22nd of June. So that's not too long. I'm very much looking forward to doing some testing on this. I think it's going to be some really cool, super fun stuff. And now, well, NVIDIA and the RTX 30 series as the company have announced both the 3080 Ti as well as the 3070 Ti. The price of the 3080 Ti is actually uh, 1200 US dollars. Meanwhile, the RTX 3070 Ti is 599 US dollars. Um, interestingly, there was a lot less details on the 3070 Ti's performance. The specs are identical to what we've seen like a million times, and you can see them yourself in the video here. So I won't reiterate them again and again and again. But we are looking at a GPU in the case of the 3070 Ti, which is slightly beefier than the 3070. It's got an additional um, two uh, GPU clusters. So we're looking at, you know, a, a modest increase in CUDA cores. Uh, obviously, this naturally benefits the number of tensor cores, RTs, and other things too. Clock frequency also goes up a smidgen. But the biggest difference between the Ti and the 3070 Vanilla really comes down to the memory configuration. So while the memory is still only 8 gigabytes, which I do feel is a shame, um, the amount of bandwidth increasing significantly. It's almost 50% higher. So it's 448 going up to 608, which is not a small detail. It's quite a significant increase. Another really big announcement from NVIDIA actually was the, well, announcement. I kind of painted myself into a corner there, didn't I? Uh, of several games which are going to take advantage of RTX. Well, the one that basically made me giddy uh, like a schoolgirl was the um, announcement of Doom Eternal, which I had heard quite a while was going to be having ray tracing support. The developers officially confirmed it, I believe. But obviously, I've just been kind of waiting and I lost my progress because I'm a reviewer and I forgot to make a backup of my save. But uh, yeah, I'm not bitter about that at all. <laughs> But um, yeah, uh, I'm actually really looking forward to playing it again. I've just been waiting, to be, to be honest, to kind of play through it with RTX enabled. The frame rate on an RTX 3080 Ti looked really good. And there were other notable games like Red Dead Redemption. I think it's about time we started to get software support for this. And obviously, you know, ray tracing is not exclusive to NVIDIA anymore. So it just benefits the ecosystem at large. I'm ultra ultra super duper like 1 billion percent excited to see what happens in let's say three to six months when fsr is more established in the market and we can start doing some really meaningful comparisons uh just for example what if we took a 6800 xt with fsr and then started to compare it against nvidia's dlss solutions or what happens if we buy an fsr on a 3080 versus a 6800 xt what about performance scaling what about image quality god there's a lot of cool stuff going on in tech um but anyway i think that's just about it for me today hopefully you've enjoyed my rambling again sorry for me not being on camera but um yeah i've just got stuff everywhere and I can't show it off on camera, and it would have taken me absolutely ages to clean it up. Plus, also, to be honest, I'm sure you'd much rather see cool stuff of, like, stacked dies rather than me rambling. With that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.